everyone, and thanks for joining us uh, for the second day uh, of this SIP on quasars during reionization. Uh, we will wait one or two more minutes for people to join. All right, so today we'll have the last two sessions of this online conference, which will be on the hosts uh, of high quasars and on the proximity zones around them uh, and their immediate environments. Uh, one of our talks will be remote uh, to accommodate uh, the many time zones that the attendants are from. Uh, I also noticed that uh, there were still many questions being asked on the Slack about yesterday's talks uh, after the talks had ended, when people uh, in other time zones were starting to wake up. So if yesterday the speakers from yesterday are still around, uh, please, please continue checking uh, the Slack threads. And, and the speakers for, uh, from today, uh, also please try to answer questions uh, either tomorrow or next week, if you can. Uh, can I also uh, remind people that the, you can turn your cameras on if you want to um, provide a friendlier environment uh, for our speakers. And at the end of uh, each talk, uh, you, you can unmute yourself and give them a round of applause. OK, so without further ado, our first speaker for today is Manuela Bischetti, who is a postdoc at the Astronomical Observatory in Trieste, who will be telling us about um, root absorption line outflows at high redshift. Yes, hello. Let me just share my screen. You should be able to see it now. Um, can you can you confirm if you see it, please? Yeah, yeah it looks okay, great. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, so um, today I will talk about uh, quasar-driven outflows uh, back to the book of reionization. So uh, um, to this uh, purpose, I will focus on uh, uh, luminous uh, quasars. So uh, let me just uh, quickly recall why they are primary targets to hunt for uh, powerful uh, supermassive black hole-driven outflows. Uh, you see from this uh, plot of the mass rate as a function of the AG and volumetric luminosity uh, for uh, outflows uh, revealed in different uh, gas phases uh, that uh, essentially uh, for all phases, the largest values are observed in uh, uh, luminous quasars. Uh, unfortunately, uh, essentially no redshift six uh, uh, points are on this uh, plot. And uh, um, for what concerns the ionized phase, 
uh, outflows in luminous quasars have been observed uh, up to redshift uh, three, four, uh, for example, uh, uh, in the WISH uh, quasar project. But uh, uh, for what uh, concerns the cold gas phase, so the direct fuel for star formation, uh, essentially what we know so far is uh, mostly limited to uh, low moderate luminosity AGN, AGN in the universe and only a few examples exist uh, at high redshift. Uh, but uh, today I would like to go back to the uh, reionization epoch and uh, uh, we know uh, that uh, a, a feedback mechanism must have been in place at such early epochs because we observe that massive quiescent galaxies are already in place at redshift 3 and uh, even larger redshift. And uh, um, as this uh, feedback occurred in uh, a quasar redshift, uh, let's say, 6, um, so far uh, we have uh, uh, one uh, clear detection of an outflow in the uh, cold gas phase uh, in uh, Rashid 6 uh, quasar by Maiolino et al, Ciccone et al, and uh, um, several uh, works reporting no detection of uh, outflows or low significant detection. So for this reason, uh, last year, uh, we decided to uh, go for the first systematic investigation of the occurrence of agent-driven outflows in uh, uh, the first quasar population. So essentially what we did was uh, uh, collecting uh, all uh, uh, quasars with available ARMA observation of the uh, carbon to emission line. And uh, uh, we assembled, assemble, assembled a sample of 48 quasar with uh, uh, bolometric luminosity of 10 to the 47 on average per second in a redshift range between uh, five and seven. And, uh, uh, by uh, stacking the uh, carbon-2 spectra of this uh, whole uh, sample, we found that cold hot flows in the early universe are actually there. As you can see from this uh, uh, stacked spectrum, uh, the uh, carbon-2 profile shows uh, uh, high uh, velocity wings which extend uh, up to a velocity of uh, 1000 km per second associated with uh, outflowing gas. And uh, um, we also found that the uh, luminosity of these broad uh, wings uh, correlates with that of the uh, quasar. So essentially, uh, this identifies the agent as the main driving mechanism of the high luminosity uh, carbon-2 emission. So uh, this is an agreement with what found the lower redshift uh, that uh, high luminosity quasars accelerate the most powerful outflows. And uh, uh, by stacking the ALMA data cubes, um, it was also possible to derive the average extent of these uh, uh, cold outflows. And uh, as you can see from this uh, uh, velocity integrated map of the high velocity carbon emission, uh, the uh, typical radius of the C2 outflow is uh, uh, about three kiloparsecs. So these uh, uh, winds extend on galactic scale. Um, we also tried to characterize the impact of these uh, uh, outflows. Uh, and uh, uh, we derived the typical uh, neutral mass outflow rate of the order of 100, 200 solar masses per year, which uh, uh, as you can see from these uh, uh, pink stars here, uh, are lower than uh, what expected from uh, local relation. So these uh, uh, may be uh, telling us that cold outflows at high redshift uh, might be less efficient in removing gas than uh, in uh, uh, local AGN. But uh, uh, let me uh, focus now on uh, what uh, uh, would be the um, 
a good observational strategy to detect uh, uh, carbon to heart flows uh, at redshift six. So uh, for this purpose, uh, we um, built some more calm observations of uh, carbon to emission from uh, a system uh, consisted of a galaxy plus a heart flow. And uh, we, um, let's say, observed this system with two different array configuration, a low resolution uh, 0.8 arc second and a high resolution configuration with a beam of 0.2 arc second. And uh, um, to constrain the uh, galaxy and outflow uh, C2 parameters, essentially, um, uh, we use the information I've just uh, uh, show you uh, before from the stack, and uh, um, we required uh, the same exposure time for the low resolution and the high uh, um, angular resolution observations. So this uh, translates uh, into the same uh, RMS sensitivity uh, for a uh, unit of ALMA beam. And uh, However, if you uh, look at these uh, two spectra uh, corresponding uh, to the low resolution, high angular resolution, you see that while high uh, velocity emission is uh, observed uh, for the uh, low resolution configuration, essentially no uh, high velocity wings are detected at the high resolution. And this is uh, because, oops, sorry, uh, this is because uh, for a given extraction aperture, uh, the high resolution observations are noisier. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the uh, same wings uh, um, get lost uh, in the uh, noise. And uh, the, 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 same is, the same result uh, can be seen also in the ALMA uh, simulated maps. And uh, in the high resolution, the outflow uh, resol is resolved with uh, low significance in uh, uh, many beams, so essentially cannot be uh, detected. And uh, this is telling us that the tailored ALMA observations are needed uh, in order to uh, detect and uh, characterize the cold outflows. But uh, let me uh, now move to uh, another kind of uh, heart flows uh, as uh, probed, uh, um, as traced by the ionized gas phase. And to, to do so, uh, let me introduce the XQR theory sample, uh, the ultimate shooter legacy survey of quasar redshift uh, between 5.8 and 6.6. .6. Uh, which is an ISO large program with VLT uh, targeting 30 quasars uh, selected to uh, be luminous in the J magnitude. And uh, um, these are deep high resolution observations and uh, uh, most of the sample has already been observed with high signal to noise. And uh, uh, I would like to focus on ionized half flows in uh, XQR theory quasars as uh, traced by broad absorption lines. And uh, uh, you see here an example of an X shooter spectrum from XQR theory. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, uh, broad uh, blue shifted absorption are uh, visible um, um, blue world of the carbon four and silicon four uh, ions. The uh, first step to identify BAL quasars is uh, um, to uh, derive the intrinsic continuum emission. And uh, uh, this can be uh, done by creating for each quasar a, a template, which is based on uh, uh, lower redshift sources uh, selected to match the uh, carbon pore velocity shift and the uh, colors uh, of the um, XQR3 quasar. And uh, you see this uh, uh, template uh, here by the uh, magenta curve. And essentially, uh, this uh, allows uh, to uh, derive a residual spectrum and uh, identify the uh, broad absorption line features. So uh, you can see here 
this uh, um, residual spe spectrum as a uh, function of the uh, velocity uh, corresponding with respect to the uh, carbon-4, silicon-4, and nitrogen-5 uh, um, peak. And uh, uh, broad absorption line features are indicated in uh, green. And uh, uh, you see uh, in all these uh, examples that uh, BAL are observed in uh, uh, several, in, in different ions, uh, carbon-4, silicon-4, nitrogen, although uh, for uh, uh, most sources, uh, uh, the high velocity uh, BAL falls blueward of lemon alpha, so uh, in a, a strongly absorbed uh, spectral region. And uh, uh, these uh, BAL reach uh, a very high velocity of the order of 20,000 to 50,000 kilometers per second. And uh, uh, to uh, put these uh, in a wider context, you can see here the distributions of the uh, panicity index uh, maximum and minimum velocity for the carbon-4 uh, BAL in the XQR3 quasars. Uh, compared to uh, BAL in uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey at lower redshift, uh, essentially between redshift 1.5 and 4. And uh, uh, it's uh, evident from all uh, the, this, this distribution, see for example the maximum velocity here, that uh, BAL outflows in XQR30 show higher uh, velocities. Uh, with respect to lower redshift quasars. And uh, um, although these two samples show uh, similar volumetric luminosities. Um, we uh, also uh, found that uh, the BAL quasars are common in redshift 6. Uh, and we found uh, it essentially a 30% fraction of strong BAL, which uh, increasing to 50% by including also weak BAL, uh, while uh, for comparison, the fraction in, in SDSS uh, is 10-50% uh, for the old uh, quasars, and uh, it slightly increases uh, to 20% uh, in color, ma color matched uh, sources, essentially uh, selected in this uh, region um, by uh, comparing uh, uh, the similar uh, rest frame colors in Redshift 6 uh, quasar and uh, the corresponding uh, SDSS colors. And uh, um, so this uh, high BAL fraction of 30 to 50% res redshift 6 uh, is uh, telling us that BAL quasar may represent the uh, dominant accretion mode uh, at redshift 6. So uh, just to uh, wrap up, um, I've shown you that supermassive driven hot flows are uh, detected uh, back to the reionization epoch in both the uh, cold and ionized gas phase. Uh, um, C2 outflows as uh, traced by uh, the stacking of ALMA observations are common and uh, although uh, tailored ALMA observations are needed to properly detect and characterize them. And uh, uh, BAL outflows uh, seem uh, to be also uh, common with a high fraction of about uh, 30 to 50%. And uh, uh, JWST uh, will allow us to have a breakthrough uh, for what concerns uh, the detection of outflows in the early universe, because it will allow us to probe the oxygen tree counterparts of these outflows and uh, uh, probe their size, their energetics, uh, and so to uh, assess uh, their impact in uh, the host galaxy interstellar medium and even on uh, circumgalactic scales. Uh, that's all for me, thank you. Thank you very much. So we have time uh, only for one question, and it's from Valentina asking, why is the same observing time chosen for the low resolution and high resolution observations? 
Um, because, um, how can I say, um, it's, uh, it's to explain that uh, even uh, with uh, the same sensitivity as like different studies with uh, uh, reaching comparable sens sensitivities uh, get uh, conflict results. So in this case, uh, uh, like in our work, we detect the outflows, but other odors uh, uh, essentially uh, do not see these high velocity wings. Oh. So this was to uh, show that even with uh, comparable sensitivity, the uh, configuration can uh, uh, highly impact on the detection of the outflow. Thank you. I'm sure there will be more questions uh, online. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Antonio Pensabene from uh, the INAF in Bologna, uh, who will be telling us about ALMA multiphase ISM. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So, uh, hello everybody, I'm Antonio Pensabene, PhD student at the uh, ENAF Astrophysics and Space Science Observatory at University of Bologna. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers for giving me the opportunity of presenting my work in this very nice and exciting meeting. And today I'm going to show you some results on uh, ISM characterization in Quasaros galaxies uh, are received greater than six uh, with ALMA. Uh, all the results that I'm going to show you uh, are collected uh, in a paper that was recently submitted uh, thanks to the efforts of many people that are listed here, in particular uh, Dr. Roberto De Carli, which is my PhD super supervisor. Uh, sorry. Uh, this work is focused on uh, two systems that I show you at the bottom of these slides. Uh, the systems are composed by a quasar and nearby companion galaxies in the proximity, uh, the systems are PJ38-21, are redshift 6.2, roughly, and PJ23-1-20, are redshift 6.5. Here you can see recent ALMA high resolution C plus observation, in which you can clearly uh, distinguish the emission from the quasar and the emission from the companion galaxy. Uh, this project is based on a serendipitous uh, discovery of various Quasar host uh, companion galaxy pairs, a redshift uh, greater than six, published in, a, um, in the Carly and collaborators paper in 2017. And the very interesting aspects uh, of uh, these systems is that uh, the companion galaxies do not show evidence of AGN activity as revealed by near infrared observation. Therefore, uh, these systems are a perfect laboratory in order to study the interplay between uh, uh, black hole growth, uh, star formations, the massive galaxies uh, as they emerge from cosmic dome. Okay, uh, the cold gas emission uh, in Quesa Hosta at high redshift is typically studied uh, uh, by using bright tracers uh, of the ISM, such as uh, C plus uh, uh, or C plus atomic phi structure line or um, uh, CO rotational lines. However, we have to keep in mind that uh, the ISM is a very complex environment composed by different phases uh, exposed to a variety of, the, of uh, physical conditions. Therefore, in order to dissect uh, the different phases of the ISM, we need to target a sample of uh, far infrared diagnostics. Uh, for this reason, I started on uh, already collected uh, ALMA cycle 3, 5, and 7 observation that target 11 main emission uh, uh, lines, as well as uh, far infrared continuum uh, that trace uh, the, dust, uh, the dust emission in, this, uh, in these two systems that I told you before. Okay, here I briefly show you all the detection that we have, starting from the system uh, PJ23-1-20. Here you can see very nice detection of uh, N plus line in both quasar and companion galaxy. Uh, N plus is uh, typically associated to the full ionized phase of the ISN. We also have uh, CO726 and C1 in both of the systems that uh, are associated to molecular and atomic medium respectively. Uh, we also have multiple CO line at IJ, in particular in the quasars, but not in the, in the companion. And this is a very first evidence of uh, less excited medium in the companion galaxy uh, 
compare with respect to the Cresa host. Uh, then we also have uh, uh, three H2O lines detections that are very interesting lines because uh, uh, they trace uh, the warm dense phase of the ISM for which there is uh, very little information uh, of such high redshift. Unfortunately, we don't, have, we don't uh, detect the design in the companion galaxy. And finally, we also have a very nice OH doublet uh, in both the, in both the uh, galaxies. For the other system, PJ38-21, unfortunately, we only have sparse detections. And this is due to the fact that the ALMA program was not completed. Therefore, all the results that uh, I'm going to show you in the next slide uh, are mainly focused on the previous systems, not this. Here you can see the continuum maps in four frequency setups for these systems and only two in the other one. As you can see, our observation were designed in order to do not resolve the emission in the single sources, but with a high enough angular resolution in order to disentangle the companion galaxy from the Quasar host. Okay, we started by combining uh, all the information uh, uh, about far infrared continuum in the different ALMA bands, and uh, in order to um, put a quantitative constraint on dust properties. To do these, we modulated the dust uh, spectral energy distribution by using a, a modified black body, uh, also taking into account the effect of the CMB that is a very, a very important source of heating and a background source against which we measure the line and the continuum emission. And we also assume a typical dust temperature of 57, 47 Kelvin, this is typical dust temperature observed in a redshift quasar. And this is required to break the degeneracy between three parameters due to the lack, uh, essentially, due to the lack of uh, uh, data point near to, the peak, near to the peak of the dust CD. Uh, by, by, by doing this, we retrieved the estimate of uh, dust masses and spectral emissivity index uh, in both quasar and companion galaxies. And for, the, for this latter source, we also considered uh, uh, an additional scenario with lower dust temperature in order to take into account uh, uh, the lack of uh, a strong AGN in this, uh, in this source. We also did the same thing on the other systems, uh, the other system, but in this case, uh, uh, as you can expect, uh, the, the constraints on the dust parameters are shallower due to the lack uh, of data point, essentially. Okay, then we tried to put uh, um, also quantitative constraint on um, uh, the physical properties of the different phases uh, of the ISM. And to do this, uh, we run a set of model using cloud irradiated transfer codes in order to simulate the, the uh, typical photo and X-ray dominated region. Cloudy solves uh, basically the relative transfer equation across the cloud, uh, predict uh, the line intensity as they emerge uh, from the cloud surface. And we run uh, these models by varying two main parameters, the uh, hydrogen volume, volume density of the cloud and the strength of radiation field at which uh, the clouds uh, are exposed uh, in two cases, PDR and XDR regime. Then we compared our observation with cloudy predictions uh, in order to put uh, uh, constraints on, uh, on the parameters. We started uh, with the C plus over C1 line ratio that is a powerful tool in order to distinguish uh, the PDR from XDR regime. Uh, as you can see, our observation, the colored area and lines are uh, well reproduced by, by cloudy, cloudy models in PDR regimes by also combining other information, uh, for example, C1 over total infrared luminosity, C plus over total infrared luminosity, we can, as you can see, we can put uh, a good constraint, order of magnitude constraint on the strength of radiation field, of local radiation field, and exclude the XDR regime, of course. Then we can study, for example, the fraction of uh, C plus arising from the, from the PDR uh, to do this, uh, we assume that typical C plus over N plus ratio of three that is typically observed in H2 regions. And uh, with this assumption, we computed the fraction of uh, C plus arising from the neutral medium. And the main result here is that uh, the neutral medium can account for almost all C plus emission, both, both quasar and companion galaxies of our study. 
then we can also combine uh, um, all uh, our CO uh, lines in order to study the CO spectral energy distributions and compare them with those of local star bust and AGN and uh, other high redshift quasars. As you can see, for example, one of our quasars, the gold circle, uh, are, are roughly consistent with uh, the CO's led, average CO sleds of the local AGN and other redshift quasars, while uh, for the companion galaxies, uh, the, the, the pink circle, um, the, the CO spectral energy distribution appear less excited, more similar to the local star bus galaxy. As I told you before, the lack of IJ uh, CO uh, line detection suggests us that uh, this, the companion galaxies uh, um, ISM are less excited than uh, the ISM in Quasar host. Then we can also try to perform a fit of our CO spectral energy distribution. Here you can see the cloudy models and the very different between PDR and XDR regime are in the IJCO lines that are uh, um, more excited uh, in, the XDR, in the XDR regime. By using these models, uh, we can uh, try to uh, perform a fit of uh, one of uh, our CO sled by using a composite model with a PDR that taking account the emission of low JCO line and XDR that dominates uh, at IJ. And the result is that uh, the, the PDR account for almost all the molecular mass and the uh, low JCO lines likely associated to the, uh, an extended gas reservoir while uh, I, uh, high JCO lines are dominated by XDR that likely arise from um, central region quasar host. Okay, then we can try to, uh, to do some, uh, similar things uh, with, uh, by combining our H2O lines. At the top of this slide, you can see the prediction of H2O spectral energy distribution from cloudy, and at the bottom right, uh, the best fit model. Here, the, the main result is that our model point to a, um, a medium with a high hydrogen volume density exposed to strong radiation field with high um, uh, column, hydrogen column density. Therefore, H2O emission in this, uh, in this source is uh, likely arise in the deep of molecular clouds. Then we can further, uh, further explore the warm and dense phase uh, of the ISM in the sources, uh, for example, by studying the relation between H2O luminosity and total inferior luminosity. As you can see, one of our quasar al lie almost perfectly on this relation that is uh, uh, likely the consequence of uh, infrared pumping mechanism that populate the higher level of this uh, molecule. And then we can also study uh, the H2O over OH line ratio. And with this ratio, we found basically um, the similar, similar results uh, uh, with respect to what we found with, our, with other tracers. So high density medium exposed to strong radiation field. Okay, to summarize, in order to dissect uh, the, the, the physical properties of the different phases of the ISM, we need to target uh, um, a sample of uh, far infrared diagnostics associated to different phases of the ISMs. And we can also study the impact of black hole, uh, black hole growth and star formation uh, on the ISM of Quasar Hostar Cosmic Dome. Our results suggest that uh, the, the ISM in Quasar Host appear more excited than, the, than that of uh, Quasar, uh, the companion galaxy. And another interesting aspect is that we can put quantitative constraint on the ISM uh, physical properties are redshift greater than six in case of host by employing a very simple self-consistent uh, radiative transfer model by varying only few free parameters. Finally, I would like to, um, to, to, to end my talk with the, these slides because uh, we are very interested in the warm dense phase of the ISM uh, there is, uh, as I've told you before, there is very little information on this phase of such a high redshift. For this reason, we started an observational campaign with uh, Noema Interferometer in order to target uh, multiple H2O lines in a sample of uh, infrared bright uh, Quasar host. And this uh, is a work is in progress in, in collaborator with Paul van der Werf uh, from uh, University of Leiden and uh, of course, uh, Roberto Descartes.
Okay, uh, that's it for me. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Antonio. That was great. We have time for two questions. Um, the first one is from uh, Huan Chen Chen, who asks, what is the thermal equilibrium time scale of dust heating? If the quasar is very young, does it, does it require a non-equilibrium model? Okay, uh, this is a very good point. Actually, I, we did not explore this, uh, this aspect. Uh, but for example, uh, yes, of course, further investigation uh, are needed. In particular, we have to consider uh, other kind of model, for example, uh, including shocks or including uh, cosmic rays uh, excitation. But uh, OK, I don't have an, uh, an answer for, for this question about the dust eating time scale. But of course, uh, it's a good point. And the second question is kind of related. Uh, do, do you run constant temperature cloudy models? Uh, how does temperature affect your cloudy calculations? OK. Uh, no, uh, the, the cloudy model are not uh, isothermal, but uh, with the constant pressure and constant density. Uh, sorry, constant density, not, uh, not isothermal model. OK, thank you very much, Antonio. Thank you. Uh, next. Uh, next up, we have a talk from Madeleine Marshall, who unfortunately could not give the talk herself, as it is currently uh, half past three in the morning at her uh, location. Uh, but she shared a pre-recorded talk uh, that I will put up now. She will be online uh, tomorrow to answer questions. Uh, can you all see this? Yes. Hello, my name is Maddie. So glad uh, to be here speaking with you today. Unfortunately, I can't be here live, um, but I'm really looking forward to being able to watch all of the talks uh, later once it's a reasonable time zone here in Australia. So today I'm going to tell you about some work that I've been doing using the blue tide simulation to make predictions for what we will be able to observe in terms of quasar host galaxies with JWST. So uh, in the local universe, there exist extremely tight correlations between the properties of a black hole and its host galaxy. So here we have the black hole mass against bulge luminosity, velocity to dispersion and bulge mass. And so um, this suggests some kind of relationship between the growth of black holes and their host galaxies. Uh, we're not entirely sure what that is. And the best way of trying to understand why these relationships occur is investigating how they evolve with redshift. So uh, measuring black holes at higher redshift is relatively easy because we've got quasars that are extremely bright and we can see out to higher redshifts. Measuring the host properties, however, is where things get a bit trickier. So here we have uh, host galaxies in the local universe. Uh, these are two images with uh, HST. So you can see the really bright quasar at the center, which uh, um, has surrounding uh, more extended emission from the host galaxy. So this uh, and measuring the properties of these galaxies is quite relatively easy uh, at low redshift, but things get much trickier when you go to higher redshifts. So here we have again an HST image of a redshift 2 quasar. You can see now that that uh, quasar emission is really starting to dominate the image that we see. And so the way that you can try and detect the underlying uh, galaxy emission is by doing some uh, advanced modeling. And so by modeling the uh, PSF of the telescope to account for the quasar emission, uh, you can basically subtract off the quasar and see what's left underneath. And so this has worked uh, really well at redshift two. However, if you go to even higher redshift, so redshift six, uh, this is another HST image uh, obtained by the same team 
And we're at shift six quasar, and you can see now that really we're just getting the PSF of the telescope and there's no extended emission. But applying the same modeling techniques, you could still hope that there is underlying host emission there. Uh, but unfortunately, that is not the case. And so uh, with uh, our best telescopes at the moment, it is not possible to detect the rest frame UV uh, emission from high redshift quasar host galaxies. However, uh, we still can get some inf interesting information out of these kinds of uh, techniques. So here is a study that we published earlier this year, looking at uh, a small sample of redshift six quasars. You can see that we, uh, using the subtraction technique, have got uh, stellar mass limits and we can now place these objects on the black hole stellar mass relation. But we've only got limits at the moment. We really would like detections. Uh, in terms of uh, measurements, we can actually alternatively go to the rest frame far infrared. However, that's tracing the gas and the dust in the galaxies. So um, it doesn't tell us about the stellar properties, which is typically where these black hole host correlations uh, exist. So uh, hopefully things will change with the launch of James Webb next year. So James Webb, I'm sure you're all very aware, is an infrared telescope. And so what this means is that while HST can give us uh, rest frame UV coverage of these redshift six quasars, um, we'll now be able to also observe uh, their optical emission, which hopefully will make things a, li a little bit easier as well. But the main uh, exciting thing, I think, in terms of this kind of science is that with its uh, much larger collecting area, Webb will have much better resolution and hopefully we'll be able to start actually resolving some of these quasar host galaxies. So in this work, we're trying to address a few key questions. So firstly, will JWST actually be able to observe the host galaxies of Redshift 7 quasars? Um, Secondly, what's the best observing strategy using James Webb to observe these quasars? And so for this, I'm only considering photometric observations uh, just because uh, of the way um, that these uh, HST studies have been completed in the past. Uh, and then finally, what are the best quasars to target with JWST? Are some going to be more detectable than others? So for this, we're using the uh, blue tide simulation making mock images of the quasars and then running them through the observational pipeline used in these HST studies to see whether JWST will actually be able to make uh, these kind of detections. So the blue tide simulation uh, is an enormous uh, hydrodynamical cosmological simulation with a box height of almost 600 megaparsec on a site. So this uh, massive volume means that there are lots of these very rare high redshift quasars that we can study. Unfortunately, because of the volume is so large, that blue tides has only been run at very high redshifts and down to redshift seven. However, at redshift seven, there are already hundreds of quasars uh, in the simulation. And so for this work, we focus on uh, SDSS-like bright quasars of which there are 22 with magnitudes greater than 22.8. And so we then make mock images with synth of software of each of these 22 quasars, uh, and then basically trick our observational pipeline into thinking that these are real observations. And then we can um, make some detailed predictions of what JWST will see. So in terms of the observational pipeline, uh, for the PSF modeling, we're using PSF-MC. Uh, so developed by Myra Mechley uh, in the uh, earlier work that I showed you in the introduction. Um, and so this is a MCMC based 2D surface brightness modeling software, which allows you to model the image uh, that you get from the telescope as containing a quasar and a host galaxy, basically allows you to subtract that quasar light off and see what's left underneath. So the way these observations work uh, in reality is we have to characterize the PSF of the telescope. And the best way that we've found to do that is by taking uh, observations of stars. And so for this work, we actually make mock star images as well as mock quasar images. And so we have, uh, we pass these images through the PSF MC pipeline and then uh, see 
uh, what we get. So for this, we model the quasar as a point source and the host galaxy as a CERSIC profile. And then we also run an additional model where we just include the point source quasar. Then we can comp compare statistically these two models to determine whether the uh, host galaxy is statistically uh, significantly detected. So uh, as an example, so here we have one quasar uh, observed in both HST and JWST uh, in the H band uh, with an exposure time of 4.8 kiloseconds. So this left panel here is what you get when looking with a telescope. So, um, uh, so it has the quasar emission and the host galaxy emission. And so we pass this through PSFMC and it finds the best fit CERSIC model uh, for the host galaxy. If you look at the residual uh, with the quasar subtracted, uh, we have these images here. And then in the final plot uh, on the right, uh, in the right panel, we have what the host actually looks like. Now, the benefit of having these simulations is that we, we know what the, quasar, the host galaxy looks like without the quasar light. And so we know directly what to compare it to. So ideally, you want this PSF subtracted panel to look uh, like the true host panel. So uh, running the statistical analysis, uh, we find for this example, HST makes no successful detection, uh, but JWST does. And so looking at all 22 of our quasars, we find that HST can detect none of these uh, host galaxies, while JWST in the same exposure times and uh, wavelengths can detect 10 of the 22. And so we can visualize that here. So we've got the fraction of successful detections as a function of wavelength, uh, Hubble detecting none, uh, James Webb detecting almost 50%. And so to answer the question, will JWST be able to observe the host galaxies? It seems a very promising yes. But can we do better than 50%? So here uh, is an image of one of the quasars uh, after PSF subtraction uh, in various exposure times, so from 1 to 10,000 seconds, against the true image of the host galaxy. Now, if we look again at the fraction of successful detections uh, as a function of wavelength, so we're considering the F200W band here, uh, you can see that, so for 1, 2.5, 5, and 10 kiloseconds, we get increasingly better uh, successful uh, success fractions. And so in terms of the best observing strategy, it really looks like we need more than five kilosecond exposures to guarantee that we're getting a really large fraction of successful detections, so more than 50%. So uh, those were in the F200W filter, but what about different filters? So we have on the top row uh, the... Um, one quasar, again, uh, in each of the wideband near cam filters, redward of the Redshift 7 Lyman break. Uh, and then, so this is the PSF subtracted image against the true image. So what we find uh, is the success rates here. So red for 10,000 seconds and uh, orange for 5,000 second exposures. And what we find is that actually the longer wavelength filters have larger success rates. Um, however, the shorter wavelength filters aren't particularly bad. It just may mean that we may, may need to supplement uh, the shorter wavelength uh, exposures with more, more exposure time. So finally, we also consider MIRI, uh, which is shown here for the shortest wavelength filter. Um, and so we find that MIRI in this field has a success rate of less than 30%. And so uh, longer wavelength MIRI filters will have lower sensitivity and are likely to perform even worse. So what we find is that really uh, near cam is the way to go in terms of getting a lot of successful detections of host galaxies. So the final question then is what kind of quasar should we target to optimize our uh, number of successful detections? So for this, we classify a host galaxy as detectable if it's detected in five or six of the six filters. 
uh, or undetectable if it's detected in less than five, just for simplicity. And so we've got the black here uh, detected and the white are the undetectable host galaxies. So here we have the uh, host brightness against AGN brightness. Uh, and these histograms actually show the success fractions. And so here we see that the uh, brighter host galaxies have larger success rates than fainter host galaxies. And so what we find is that quasar host galaxies may be more detectable if they're bright, and massive, have relatively low Bolsha total mass ratios and are more extended. However, with our large error bars uh, from our small sample size, none of these trends are actually statistically significant. So in conclusion, will JWST be able to observe the host galaxies of high redshift quasars? The answer hopefully is yes. Um, and then in terms of best observing strategies, we really need large exposure times, more than 5,000 seconds, the long wavelength filters and near cam seems optimal compared to MIRI. What are the best quasars to target? Well, statistically, we find no significant trends. However, if you've got an ALMA image that shows really extended emission, very massive galaxy, maybe that's a good one to target. So thanks so much for listening. Uh, a paper about this is coming out soon. Please, if you have any questions, let me know via the Slack channel. I'll be sure to answer them when I wake up in the morning um, and feel free to email me uh, at the email address below. Thanks so much. Sarah, you're unmuted. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I was saying there's already quite a few questions from Madeleine uh, on the Slack, so hopefully she'll get to them uh, in a few hours. Uh, and to round up the session and transition from the host of Quasars to their immediate surroundings, uh, we have uh, Varsha Kolkarni, who will talk about mining for metals at Cosmic Dawn. Okay. I'm sorry, can you uh, unmute yourself again? Varsha, can you unmute your microphone? Hi. Uh, can you guys see this and hear me? Uh, yes. Yes? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. So, all right. Hello, I'm Varsha Kolkani, and I'm from the University of South Carolina. I'd like to begin by, first of all, thanking uh, both Sarah and Jawe for organizing this uh, very exciting conference. I'm very happy to hear all these uh, wonderful talks. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge a couple of a few of my collaborators, Suraj Powdal, who was a grad student who just uh, graduated. Um, also, uh, Debopam Shom and Francie Cashman, who are also former students and are now at Space Telescope, and several other people, Celine Peru, Sean Morrison, Brenda Fry, and a current student, uh, Jiang Ho Wan. So I'm going to talk about mining for metals during the cosmic dawn with high Richard quasars, and I'm going to talk both about uh, surroundings of quasars, so gas around quasars, but also going further out to probe the global uh, cosmic chemical evolution with quasars. Okay, so here's my outline. I'll give a very quick introduction and then talk about absorbers near high redshift quasars, and then global chemical evolution, and then finally relative element abundances. So uh, here is a simulation for the hydrogen neutral hydrogen gas and metals at redshift of around five and uh, in a region 12 megaparsecs by 12 megaparsecs by 10 kiloparsecs. And uh, one can see that the H1 is very filamentary. Uh, the metals tend to follow that uh, to some extent, but they're also, they also occupy very narrow, very small 
cross section on the sky. Um, and what that means is it's hard to hard to probe them. And so DLAs along the sight lines to background quasars, that offers the most efficient way to probe these dense regions. And one can see that, uh, that I'm sorry. One can see that the range of metallicities uh, predicted goes down to at least a thousand, maybe even lower. But there are regions that are substantially metal rich as well. So uh, this is in, indeed what we do. We take a background quasar and uh, the quasar sight line goes through circumgalactic as well as intergalactic medium. And uh, that can allow us to trace both inflows of metal poor intergalactic gas as well as outflows of chemically enriched gas back into the IGM through the CG. And uh, we are all familiar with this uh, wonderful uh, representation of quasar absorption lines here, but you have the lamina alpha forest. And uh, this is a damp lamina alpha absorber associated with that are many metal absorption lines. And with high resolution spectra, so you can study these lines in detail and uh, determine their chemical, uh, determine the composition, the column densities of various metals as well as the velocity structure of the absorption systems. One thing, however, one has to be careful about is to use elements that are not sensitive to dust depletion. And that is, uh, the reason for that is obvious from this picture here, showing depletion as a function of condensation temperature. And you can see that a number of elements, including elements like silicon, chromium, iron, et cetera, can deplete uh, substantially on interstellar dust within the Milky Way and other galaxies. And of course, this is an example of cool gas, but even in warm gas, uh, you can have substantial depletions. So one has to choose elements like uh, oxygen, for example, or sulfur, or uh, elements that don't deplete too much on dust grains. And so that's what we've been doing, targeting these undepleted elements at redshift five, uh, around five and a little bit beyond five. and uh, this did this. Uh, these surveys were done with Magellan Mike, VLTX shooter, and also we used some archival KEK ESI data. And uh, the quasars are up to redshifts of five and a half absorbers in that range. And with this, we measured the abundances of the undepleted elements, oxygen, sulfur, and also of uh, some other elements like carbon and sometimes silicon, and uh, all with silicon, and sometimes also iron. And so we've nearly tripled the measurements of undepleted elements that redshifts greater than four and a half. And this uh, is useful because some of the past studies use those uh, elements that can be depleted on this. So let me now talk about uh, what we find, first of all, for absorbers near the quasars from these uh, studies. So here is approximate sub DLA at redshift 5.34, and uh, it's apparent ejection velocity. Uh, divided by speed of light is about 0.01, so it's pretty close to the quasar. It is very metal poor, and uh, one can study its structure, determine the velocity dispersion of the gas, et cetera, and I'll talk about that in just a bit. Here are a couple of other absorbers uh, from our sample that are a little bit further out, but still could be associated with the quasar, and uh, they are considerably more metal rich. Here are uh, couple of other even further, uh, even higher redshift absorbers uh, that are also proximate DLS. These are from Deodorek et al. 2018 and Manados et al. 2019. And uh, these are again very close to the quasar, but quite metal poor. So if I collect our measurements as well as those from the literature and plot metallicity versus beta, uh, the apparent injection velocity divided by speed of light, uh, this is what the current picture looks like, as, at least uh, as far as I know. And so these are the, uh, you might think of beta less than 0.04 systems as the so-called associated systems. And further out, uh, perhaps there may be some contamination from associated systems, but uh, they're probably likely to be intervening uh, for the most part. So there's a wide range in uh, metallicities, ranging from a thousand solar to almost a quarter solar even among the associated systems. And uh, maybe there are some trends here, but uh, it's, it's too small a sample and uh, there are still outliers. 
Uh, the other plot here is the plot of metallicity versus H1 column density. And uh, so 20.3 would be the quote unquote boundary between sub DLAs and DLAs. Uh, but overall, there seems to be you know, comparable metallicities for these uh, different H1 ranges. And uh, again, there is a fairly wide range in metallicity. Okay, so what do we learn about chemical evolution? So going further beyond just the regions near quasars, but going further out into the uh, general global uh, chemical evolution picture, uh, some past studies have claimed that there's a certain drop in metal city at redshift greater than 4.7. And if such a drop exists, it would be surprising because there is no corresponding signature in the cosmic star formation history. So, uh, one thing we wanted to check is whether that uh, is also seen when you use elements that don't deplete much on uh, interstellar dust grains. So here is a redshift five sub DLA. Now it is further out away from the quasar, uh, 100 solar metallicity. So it's uh, metal poor, but not terribly metal poor. And there's a factor of 20 to 30 difference in abundance ratios in different uh, velocity components of this absorber. So for example, here you can see there's a lot of carbon, a lot of silicon, but no oxygen. Right? And if you even add up all the components here, the ratio of silicon to oxygen is less than a third solar, which is surprising considering both silicon and oxygen are alpha elements. So probably this means that silicon is indeed depleted in this absorber uh, by a substantial amount. Some other absorbers from our study as well, and these are again further out. Uh, this one's metal rich, this one's not metal rich. So if we plot metallicity versus redshift, uh, these are the lower redshift DLAs and these are in fact binned data points. So each bin has a substantial number of DLAs, uh, but these are all individual measurements. And uh, this includes our points, uh, previous points uh, from Rafelsky et al, for example. Uh, also more recent measurements uh, like the ones I showed earlier. And uh, basically the red point here is the H1 weighted metallicity, an H1 weighted metallicity of just these points, right? And these are uh, a little bit higher in redshift, but uh, it's not going to change the picture too much. The blue line is the uh, best fit from lower redshift and the purple uh, point here is the simulation prediction from Finlater et al. 2018. So the predicted and observed values seem to agree within less than one sigma. And we don't see a strong evidence of a sudden drop in metal city at redshift greater than uh, 4.7, which is in fact actually consistent with uh, DGI towards 2017. Uh, so some other quick trends, uh, silicon depletion versus metallicity, iron depletion versus metallicity, and metallicity versus uh, velocity dispersion. And these are actually for uh, the samples presented in Powdell et al. So I think a few points are uh, need to be added more to these. But one can see that there is uh, depletion of iron and silicon for at least some objects. And uh, in general, uh, this may be true that the more metal poor you get, the more uh, the less depleted you are. But there are some objects that do show uh, significant depletion. The other interesting thing is the plot of metallicity versus dispersion, velocity dispersion, so velocity breadth of the line. And uh, there seems to be a uh, difference in the trend uh, that you normally see in lower redshift DLAs versus the higher redshift DLAs. And uh, not quite sure what that means. It may have a relation to a different mass metallicity relation between the two uh, populations of galaxies. It may mean perhaps that uh, the higher redshift galaxies are more dominated by dark matter and they have less stellar mass. Uh, but of course the samples are too small to make too much out of this. And the last thing I want to touch on is the relative element abundances. So for example, here's carbon to oxygen versus oxygen to hydrogen. And uh, there's a lot of scatter here, uh, but for comparison, I've shown here uh, the one and two dimensional projections of the posterior probability distributions of the progenitor star's mass, explosion energy and stellar mixing parameter of the star uh, whose supernova explosion might have enriched the DLA at redshift 5.3. And uh, while we can't really constrain the mixing parameter much, uh, it seems like we can kind of uh, put some constraints on what range of 
progenitor masses uh, might have contributed the most to such a uh, such an absorber's enrichment. And that comes out to be around 15 or 20 solar masses. Uh, in case you're interested, here is carbon to oxygen or carbon to sulfur versus absorption redshift. And uh, there is a substantial variation, but there are many subsolar carbon to oxygen uh, measurements here and no, uh, no neat clear trend. So I'll just put up my conclusions here. Basically, the range of metal cities between both associated and intervening systems, both DLAs and sub DLAs, and evolution does not show a certain drop. Uh, some systems do show dust depletion, and the metal city velocity relation may be different. And ratios like carbon and oxygen, carbon to oxygen, and even silicon to oxygen uh, will be very important in the future. And obviously, we need to increase all these samples substantially more to check for trends more robustly. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, so we have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, the first yeah. one is um, from Valentina Dodorico. For the low O1 sub DLA at redshift 5, uh, uh, can the lack of O1 be due to an ionization effect? Yeah, let me come to that. Where is that? Can the lack of O1 be an ionization effect? Yes. Uh, we did look into this and we did correct for ionization uh, based on the measurements that we have and even after correcting for ionization we found that uh, there is this difference between silicon and oxygen uh, so indeed some of the oxygen could be ionized but I, uh, since we are using o1 we are actually not sensitive to ionization correction as much because of the O1 and H1 having similar ionization potentials. But I'll be happy to answer this more in detail on Slack. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, are there any hint of pop population free yields? Sorry, can you please repeat are that? There, uh, are there any hints of population free uh, enrichment? Any signatures of population free enrichment? Yeah, that's what we are uh, looking for. And hopefully, after com comparing carbon to oxygen and silicon to oxygen, we can uh, make those kind of measurements better. But uh, the plot of metallicity versus redshift, uh, we did compare that to what are the predictions for models that do include population three versus they don't. And uh, there is not a, a lot of uh, defining uh, ability here. I, I wish I had that plot with me, but um, we can, you know, the samples are still small, but as the samples get bigger, we, we can make more. And as we get to higher redshifts, eventually, at least for the relative abundances, we can uh, discern between the various population three uh, models between IMFs, etc. Uh, thank you very much again. There are more questions online, so please have a look. Okay, thank you so much. And I will now hand over to Shawi for the uh, last session. Of today. All right, so thanks everyone for uh, hanging out here. And the last section is about uh, quasar proximity zones. We have four talks. Uh, before that, I just want to say that I think some of us, when we saw about proximity zones about 20 years ago, in these uh, realization error quasars, it was mostly out of a convenience in the sense that when the Gumpian drop kicked in, that's sort of the only place you can have some, still have some signal. So I'm really happy to see that uh, there's so many uh, really good astrophysics that problems that you can probe with them now, in both uh, in the sense of both the quasars themselves and the evolution of the IGM. So looking forward to these talks. Uh, so our first talk is from Karma Mori, Mori the Infective uh, Lifetime of Quasar Population of Redshift 6. So please go ahead. Can you all see this? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Karna Mori, and um, I'm a third year undergrad uh, at MIT. Um, and today I'll be talking about um, estimating the lifetime of 
uh, the quasar population at redshift six via um, their stacked proximity zone. Uh, and um, <clears throat> this work was done in collaboration with uh, Christina Eilers, Fred Davies, Joe Hanawi, and Rob Simcoe. Um, so first of all, I the, the main motivation for this work is um, understanding more about supermassive black holes. And supermassive black holes occupy the centers of all known massive galaxies. Uh, and the study of, of the formation and evolution of these black holes is an ongoing area of work. Um, so these black holes uh, grow primarily via accretion. Uh, and uh, one ways in which we can study this process are via quasars, which are extremely luminous objects caused by matter accretion onto black holes. And these quasars, especially at high redshift, are an extremely uh, powerful lab laboratory for understanding supermassive black hole growth in the early universe. Uh, and under, um, under the exponential model of, of a black hole growth, uh, a black hole uh, grows, exp or a, a black hole grows exponentially in the initial seed mass uh, according to this Salpeter time scale, uh, which under standard assumptions is assumed to be around, or is known to be around 45 mega years, assuming 10% uh, uh, radiative efficiency and, and Eddington limited accretion. Um, and so this means that for uh, a 100 solar mass population three stellar remnant, uh, this means that uh, the quasar would need around 10 to the nine years to actually grow into a 10 to the nine solar mass black hole. Uh, but the problem is that where we observe plenty of these quasars, uh, the universe is less than 10 to the nine years, so uh, years old. So, so really to actually understand this growth, we, there's a lot of unanswered questions. So <clears throat> I'm focused in this talk on understanding this quasar lifetime TQ. Uh, and which is the duration of the luminous quasar phase. And the reason is that if we understand this lifetime, we can really uh, start to constrain and answer more questions about uh, different parameters about this growth process, such as the initial black hole seeds or the accretion rate. And so recently, um, some of my collaborators pioneered the use of uh, proximity zones to determine the lifetime. And quasar proximity zones are the region around the quasars where the quasars ionizing radiation has ionized the, the neutral IgM and, um, and uh, therefore there's enhanced flux bluewards of Lyman alpha. And the size of this proximity zone is related to the lifetime of the quasar. So this, the amount of ionization increases as the, as the quasar gets older. And you can really see this in this animation. Um, so as, as the uh, lifetime uh, TQ increases, uh, you can see that there's more transmitted flux uh, blue words of Lyman alpha. And so um, really this is a very powerful tool because if we can measure the, the proximity zones of these quasars, we can just directly infer the lifetime. And so what, this, in this work, we stack 15 quasars at redshift six and uh, compare their stacked proximity zones to radiative transfer models, which are shown in this plot here. And so um, the, we can compare the stacked proximity zones directly to these, these models and, and measure the, pro, the, the, the lifetime of the quasar. And so we have 15 quasars in our sample um, between redshift five and a half and six and a half. And we, um, we only select quasars with a, uh, an AB magnitude at 1450 angstroms between negative 26.5 and negative 27.5. And the reason is that the size of the proximity zone not only uh, depends on the age of the quasar or the lifetime of the quasar, but also on the luminosity. And so to not bias the sample, we, we, uh, we make sure that they're all within this range. These spectra were taken using X shooter, DMOS, fire, and ESI in instruments. And so here are the 15 spectra. Um, and so uh, the the basically we uh, here are the spectra shown, and then also we performed uh, continuum normalization or continuum fits 
uh, on both the red and the blue side using the 2018 Davies method, P the PCA-based method. And these are a little bit uh, hard to see, so I zoomed in on J0842. Uh, so you can see we fit between uh, 1220 angstroms and 28 angstroms in the rest frame uh, on the red side. And then we can use uh, the, da the Davies proje projection matrices to get the blue side continuum. Um, and then we can use this later for continuum normalization. And so the, um, the analysis roadmap is we first continuum normalize all the 15 quasar spectra using our continuum fits. We then stack the quasar uh, continua via a binning algorithm. And then to understand the uncertainty on these quasar stacks, we uh, forward model the noise, the different sources of uncertainty in, in our analysis using the radiative transfer models. Uh, we can Monte Carlo sample each of the sources of uncertainty and forward model them onto these models to understand what the, the uncertainty is and to get covariance matrices. Uh, and then we can compare the, the models to the stack by performing a final fit with our modeled covariance matrices and basically estimate the lifetime directly. And so here's step one, continuum normalization. We just divide the spectra by the continuum, um, pretty standard. Uh, and then step two is, is stacking the 15 quasar spectra via binning. And so we just take a, a, a um, we just take an average of all the flux pixels within a particular wavelength bin. And we, for our final analysis, we chose 0.5 angstrom uh, bin size. And so the third step is uh, trying to quantify the noise on the stack. And so the way we do this is forward modeling the noise. And so the radiative transfer models in have for the radiative transfer models give a different model for each value of the lifetime. So we have a grid of 80 different lifetimes. And so for each value of the lifetime, for each value of TQ on our grid, we can um, basically sample, we can create mock stacks of, of uh, thousands of different mock stacks of these quasars, uh, where we, for each mock stack on each of the different quasars, we uh, sample different uh, sources of uncertainty, such as cosmic variance, PCA continuum uncertainty, redshift uncertainty, and spectral noise. And so each of what well, we just Monte Carlo sample each of these based on the parameters of those particular quasars. Um, and we can then uh, create thousands of mock stacks and then, uh, and then use basically take the covariance of all these mock stacks, uh, the wavelength bins. Uh, and so here's a, a plot of the correlation matrix. Uh, and you can see it's mostly diagonal, although there is some correlation between um, close bins. And so finally, we can use these covariance matrices and we obtain one for each value of TQ. Uh, and we can use these covariance matrices to directly inference the lifetime. And so our, um, our, the value that we get here is the posterior distribution, the, the, the median lifetime is uh, 10 to the 5.7 and shown here are the 68 and 95 percent confidence intervals and so um, and so here's here's also a plot of the comparison between the data and the models so in purple is the 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 model or the mean model from all the mock stacks uh, along with the one sigma uncertainty on on it uh, which is basically the diagonal of the covariance and so uh, you can see it fits the data fairly well. <clears throat> and so we, so this is basically a measurement of the effective lifetime of, of these 15 quasars at C equals six or uh, redshift six, but it's, it's an effective lifetime because really in our analysis, we're assuming that all the quasars have the exact same lifetime. Uh, in, our, in our mock stacks, we kind of stack all only quasars of the same lifetime. And so this is obviously not tr true in reality. These quasars come from these, the lifetimes come from a distribution. And so we kind of wanted to get a sense of what the, how introducing a, a spread a, around a mean value uh, for the quasar lifetime distribution would change it. And so in our mock stacks, we kind of introduced <clears throat> 
uh, oh, the, 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 the forward modeling process allows you to, to introduce a distribution. So instead of in our mock stacks, all having quasars of the same lifetime, we had quasars of different lifetimes uh, drawn about some distribution. And so here are shown uh, the mean models along with the one sigma uncertainty for different, uh, different widths about the same mean. So we're all using the same mean model TQ of 5.10 to the 5.7, but different widths. And you can see that there's not really any change until you get like around sigma of two. And uh, most previous work suggests that this width is probably around one or less, maybe 0.7. And so really within our method, we can't really distinguish the two. And so this kind of suggests that this effective lifetime 10 to the 5.7 is actually very close to the, the mean. Um, and so in conclusion, we, uh, we conclude that the, the effective lifetime of these quasars at redshift six is Five, 10 to the 5.7, which is very consistent with previous studies done by Christina and Ilya Kurgan. And um, this, um, this is more than a magnitude, uh, more than a magnitude sh shorter than uh, what was previously understood. Uh, recall at the beginning of the talk, I said about 10 to the nine years. And so this, um, or, or 10 to the eight years. And so this suggests that there's that, um, this possibly suggests that there's a radiatively inefficient, AKA super Eddington accretion uh, in these high redshift quasars or a significant population of obscured, UV obscured quasars at redshift six. So for future work, we want to investigate these mechanisms and actually um, understand exactly what is in this discrepancy. Uh, and so uh, thank you very much for listening and I'll uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. This is really a beautiful talk. Thank you. Um, we have some time for questions. Uh, so Tom asked, nice, uh, does the radio transfer model includes DLAs, which could be, uh, which could be what limits the extent of the near zones rather than the time, time of the quasar? Can you repeat the question? Does the, does the model includes damped alpha systems, um, which could affect how the uh, how the near zone or the proximal zone extend rather than the rather than the time a lifetime of the quasar itself? I am not exactly sure about that, but I can get back to you on the Slack about that. Does Christina or Fred know the answer? Uh, the model, so we exclude um, the any proximate DLAs or any alignment, actually any absorption systems that would truncate the proximity zone. We exclude them from the spectra itself, and so um, they should not be taken into account and not prematurely truncate the proximity zone. But the models themselves do not include any dense um, dense gas. Thank you. Any other? Uh, I have a quest quick question. When you say the uh, the dispersion of your uh, uh, of your quasar lifetime is 0.1 or one or two, I assume these are basically assuming log normal distribution of their lifetime. Yes. And these yeah. are log scale. Okay. Yeah, log normal. Like all of them are with a mean of 10 to the point five, 10 to the 5.7, or or a mean of 5.7 in log space, and then uh, sigma of zero, one or two in log space. Okay, just one more quick question from Sarah. The average lifetime constraints presumably only applies to the last UV bright phase. What is the recombination time scale of the gas? Um, I'm also not quite sure about that. Christina, do you know that? Yeah, so generally, yes. So the, the lifetime constraints only the UV bright phase because um, that's only the part that gets you the proximity zone. Um, the recombination time scale within the proximity zone is actually fairly small. So the, the, the hydrogen recombination time scale is, is large back to neutral, but within the proximity zone, you only have to recombine to very small neutral gas fraction to be opaque to limon alpha. So this does not take any like, um, 
uh, flickering, if that's your actual question, this does not take any flickering quasar light curves into account. Great. All right. There are more questions on Slack, so you can continue that discussion there. And thanks again for your really nice talk. Uh, we'll move on to the next one, which is uh, Huan Ching Chen about recovering the density field inside the quasar prognosome and redshift six. Please go ahead. Use my see my screen and my uh, yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank first to the organizers to give me this opportunity. I'm Huan Chen Chen from University of Chicago. I work with Nick Nielin in simulating the quasar proximity zooms at the end of uh, cosmic ionization. And today I'd like to talk about my project of recovering density field uh, using the Lyman alpha absorption. The Lyman alpha absorption spectra has been a powerful tool in probing the distant universe, um, especially at redshift two to five. On the right, I show an example, a very nice, uh, spectra at, of a uh, redshift uh, 3.6 quasar and blue words of the lima alpha emission line of the quasar. You can see numerous absorption created by the neutral hydrogen uh, left in the universe. And by uh, analyzing this so-called lima alpha forest, we, we now know that IgM at redshift three is in a very ionized state. And also we can learn about the density fluctuation at that redshift and thus further constrain the cosmology. And on the astrophysical side, we can use them to measure the IgM temperature as well as the radiation background. However, at even higher redshift, the lemma alpha absorption is not a favorable tool to uh, measure the IgM quantity simply because at closer to the end of reionization, the uh, ra radiation background is very low, thus there are too much neutral hydrogen in the universe that they, in most places, they will, the, they will cause this complete absorption. However, uh, there is one place we can see the non-zero transmitted flux that is the immediately close to the quasar because the high ionizing flux from the quasar will further uh, decrease the neutral fraction of the, uh, of the IgM. And this region, which we call the proximity zone, can extend up to a dozens, dozens of Komui mag parsec. And with the high spectra uh, now, which has the sub Armstrong uh, resolution, which uh, is equivalent to 10 physical kiloparsec. That means that a lot of information is hidden here and which we can potentially exploit to do a lot of science that we have done at lower redshift with the Lima Alpha Forest. And among the, the many IgM properties, the first one we want to study is the density field. And we studied them in a simulation. So we start with a crock simulation. It is a cosmological box with the adaptive refinement uh, technique. We resolve the galaxies. And in the simulation, we include the relevant physics of gas heating and cooling star formation, stellar feedback, as well as radiative transfer. And in the full simulation, the galaxies are the main reionization source and the whole box reionized at around, around redshift seven. So the 3D simulation doesn't include individual quasars. We do this by post-processing. We draw thousands of sign lines centered on massive halos and then uh, post-process them with a 1D RT code with a bright quasar spectra. So here is an example from left to right are the radiation field, the neutral fraction of the IgM and the transmitted flux. And we run the sign lines for uh, 30 million years and then uh, analyze the spectra. Uh, from this set of simulation, we uh, gain some insights 
uh, on the proximitism. So the first one is that very important point is that for the majority of the sign lines, uh, the radiation profile is a very perfect uh, power law with index minus two. For example, in this typical sign lines, at first, the cosmological filaments may attenuate the radiation from the quasar by, by a bit, but because the brightness of the quasar, this kind of structures will be ionized in no time and to be completely, completely transparent. And you, as you can see, like within thousands of years, the profile within the four physical mag parsec from the quasar reaches a perfect uh, R to the minus two power shape. And also the radiation field from the quasar is at least an order of magnitude larger than the ionization background created by the galaxies. And we should know that there are some uh, sign lines that encounter the Lyman limit systems, but usually those Lyman limit systems will just truncate the proximity zone altogether. And inside the proximity zone, usually the uh, a radiation profile is also a perfect R to the minus two. And the second thing is that ionization equilibrium time scale inside the proximitism is very short. So we can write down this uh, equation. The gamma ionization rate we know uh, is inversely proportional to R square. And the alpha, the uh, recombination rate is only a weak function of temperature. So the number density of the neutral hydrogen, uh, which is directly probed by the optical depth, is uh, dictated mainly by the density of the gas. Um, in a uniform, in a universe with uniform density, we know that the transmitted flux will be a very smooth shape, like this dashed line, which I shall call the baseline. And with the density fluctuation, the transmitted flux will fluctuate significantly. And because we know uh, gamma and alpha pretty well, to go back from the spectra to the density is also straightforward. We basically need to calculate the optical depth at each pixel and divide them by the baseline and take the square root. And the blue line sh here shows the uh, recovered density field. And we can already see this looks pretty good. So let's take a closer look at this. Um, there are several, several things I need to point out. First, because of the peculiar velocity of the gas, we can only recover the density field in the redshift space instead of the real space. So, which means we can recover the density as this black line. And because the quasar in the simulation is embedded in massive halos, which correlates to a over density field roughly equal to one physical mag parsec, in the central region, there are some bias because the features are uh, displaced by the significant inflow. While outside this region, we can see the there are no such bias. But if we are further away from the quasar, the radiation field drops. So there are more uh, saturated pixels. For example, here we cannot recover the density field. And in fact, if we assume that we can only measure the optical depth up to five, then in this region above this dotted line, uh, we can only place lower limit in the density field. And last point is that the thermal bordering will smooth the small scale spectra. So with this method, uh, we, will, we want to naturally know how we can reconstruct the density probability distribution function, which is usually a very useful statist statistical tool. So here I show the true density field calculated directly from the simulation and by smoothed by a Gaussian kernel of 25 kilometers per second. As we expected, 
uh, in the central region because the ha massive halos correlates with the over density. This inner region has a systematic more dense uh, PDF than the rest, while outside of this region, the PDF looks very similar. And the recovered density field here plotted in the dotted line, we can see that except for the inner region, which uh, is suspect to the uh, bias by the systematic inflow related to the quasar, the rest of the PDF agree very well with the true one. And here is the truncate, the truncation is because of the saturation farther away from the quasar. And in summary, uh, I hope, hopefully I persuaded that view that with the high resolution spectra we can now obtain, it is time to look into the proximitism in detail. And with this method I just described, we can measure the density field in proximity zoom at redshift six. And this method is sensitive to density fluctuation around the mean with moderate scatter. And uh, the recovered density PDF uh, agree very well with the true PDF at a distance larger than one physical mag parsec. And the last point I want to uh, mention is that uh, now that we know the cosmo we constrain the cosmology quite well, so we can model the true uh, density PDF very well. And by comp comparing the recovered density PDF to the true, we can um, uh, constrain more quantities of the quasar itself. Uh, for example, their intrinsic spectra and their environment and age and so on. And um, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to take questions. All right, so we have one, we have time, some time for questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, do you include in fact of helium ionization? Heating due to helium yes. plus um, may, may systematic influence uh, yes. everything. We, we include it and uh, the result I show here is the result for quasar lighting uh, for 30 million years. So, which means that the helium front uh, propagate throughout the outside of the four physical mag parsec. So, uh, which means that this heating effect uh, affect all the pixel here. And in fact, if this, uh, the position of the helium front will also uh, impact the uh, uh, density PDF, which is potentially useful to help to using the PDF, uh, we can uh, constrain the quasar H. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, in your recovery, you assume that you know exactly what the ionization flux for the quasar is, and uh, and also the background outside the outside background uh, uh, UV background, that right? So, uh, in so definitely, I assume that we know the we know the uh, luminosity of the quasar, and I think this is the quantity directly observable. And I assume that this uh, the quasar luminosity stayed the same during the uh, the whole time, and the background is drawn from the simulation. And this will vary by uh, a, a few factor of a few, but this will always be lower than the quasar uh, quasar radiation by roughly an order magnitude. So the background uh, uh, radiation is not as important. All right, thank you. Uh, if people have more questions, you can continue those on Slack. And now we'll move on to the next talk, which is Fred Davis small-scale structure of the pre-reanization IGM in quasar proximity zones. Fred, go ahead. All right, sure. Is this uh, coming through? Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Perfect. Okay, yeah, I'd like to, to tell everyone about this project I've been working on uh, for a little while now with Joe Hanawi, my former boss. 
um, on how we can use the proximity zones of the highest redshift quasars, so the ones pushing really deep into reionization, to probe some physics of the, of the early pre-reionization uh, IgM. All right, so why should we care about the small scale structure of the IgM? Well, it's, it's been known for quite a while that, that the small scale structure of the IgM is very sensitive to cosmology, like uh, the, the nature of dark matter, for example. So here I'm showing a few slices of cosmological or volume renderings of cosmological simulations with hot, uh, warm, and, and our favorite uh, cold dark matter. And you can see that as you go from hot to cold, that uh, due to the fact that the free streaming scale of the dark matter in, in very early times soon after the Big Bang uh, for cold dark matter is very small, you have uh, lots of structure down to basically arbitrarily small scales. Whereas for hotter alternative dark matters, uh, there tends to be some kind of small scale suppression, you know, usually invoked to try to explain missing satellites or, or something like that at redshift zero. Um, but it's also stunning, something that affects more broadly the, the intergalactic medium. Um, and, and other alternative dark matters like fuzzy dark matter and so on uh, generically produce a similar effect. So uh, usually how, the way that people study small scale structure in the IGM is by looking at the Lemon Alpha Forest. So there's been a whole industry of doing this uh, for, for many years now. Um, uh, large spectroscopic surveys with Sloan have sort of nailed down what this, uh, what this power spectrum looks like on kind of intermediate scales. Uh, and there've been some works to, to push this to higher resolution, either with you know, very high resolution shell spectrographs or sort of moderate high resolution like X shooter. So uh, the thing I wanna point out here in this fairly complicated plot, so this is showing the power spectrum, sort of like the, the strength of fluctuations in that Lyman alpha forest at various scales, going from large scales on the left uh, to uh, large scales on the right. Um, and you can see that there's this characteristic turnover in this, in this power spectrum. Uh, and this turnover is a lot stronger if you have warm dark matter. So these, these dashed lines here are showing the suppression of small scale structure uh, due to, I believe, yeah, two and a half keV uh, warm dark matter. Um, you'll notice though that actually the green models are turning over too, and there's a very good reason for this. Uh, uh, also, I should mention there, there's been a lot more, more recent literature, but this was the best figure I could find. Um, but so, so the problem with using the Lemon Alpha Forest to understand the intergalactic small scale structure is that they're, they're all pressure smoothed. So after reionization, the IgM is, is kind of generically around 10,000 Kelvin. And this means that at the mean density of the, of the universe, the gas is sort of spread out, sort of squooshed out uh, by about 100 kiloparsecs relative to the very clumpy uh, dark matter distribution. Um, and the, the genes length of the gas scales as the square root of the temperature. So if the gas were colder, uh, there would be less, less clumping. You know, the, the relevant scales would be smaller. So this is what the situation looks like at redshift of three, you know, where the Lyman alpha forest is well studied. While the gas distribution, or while the dark matter distribution is highly clumped and, and has this lovely network of, of filaments, uh, the gas distribution is a lot smoother. And so when, when people try to infer the nature of small scale structure from the Lyman alpha forest, they have to fight through this, this sort of haze of, of baryons being pressure smoothed and, and with a lot of forward modeling. Okay. But before reionization, uh, the IGM was actually very cold. Uh, so here I'm showing a plot from uh, Matt McQuinn's IGM review article uh, from several years ago now, where the red line here is the evolution of the gas temperature since recombination. So the universe recombines here, becomes neutral. Uh, it cools coupled to the CMB until about a redshift of 200 or so, and then just cools adiabatically and the temperature plummets. Uh, and it keeps plummeting until the first sources of X-rays appear in the universe. So X-ray binaries from POP3 remnants uh, kick in and rapidly fill the universe in, with X-rays and sort of moderately, kind of modestly heat the gas up to tens or maybe hundreds or thousands of Kelvin. Then finally, reionization kicks in and everything heats up to, to over 10,000 Kelvin, uh, as we saw before. So it would be really great if we could probe the small scale structure of the gas at these early times, because when the gas is this cold, so the gas is 10 Kelvin or say one Kelvin instead of 10,000 Kelvin, that means we'd be sensitive to one kiloparsec scales instead of 100 kiloparsec scales due to that scaling of the genes length. So, so 
if we could study, you know, the, the pre-reionization lemon alpha forest would be in good shape. Of course, lemon alpha forest is completely opaque at, at these high redshifts. Um, but uh, as we've now seen in a couple of talks, you still see transmission in the proximity zones of high redshift quasars. So here I'm showing a zoom in on uh, the highest redshift published quasar uh, uh, discovered by Eduardo Bonados. Um, and you can see that there is this, this region here of a bit over a thousand kilometers per second, uh, where zero here is, is systemic lemon alpha for the quasar. There's a region with transmission and there's a region with structure. You can see some nice absorption features as well. And so potentially we can use the information contained in this region to understand the structures in the very, very early universe. Now, of course, when the quasar reionizes that region around it if, it, if it's carving out its own giant Stromgren sphere, it's also rapidly heating the gas by say a few tens of thousands of Kelvin. But fortunately, if the quasar has only been on for 10 to the six years as, as Karna was showing, the gas actually hasn't had time to respond to this new heat injection. Uh, so here I'm gonna show a movie of, of sort of low resolution in a one megaparsec box of, of uh, the formation of structure in this, in this small hydrodynamical simulation. Reionization happens at a redshift of about 8.3 and the baryonic structure just starts to explode. So it's all been heated to several thousand up to 10,000 degrees Kelvin. And the, the initial sort of pre-reionization one kiloparsec scale just gets completely destroyed. But, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this movie very carefully here. If we go back to when reionization occurs, whoop, okay, the gas is now hot. It actually takes a substantial amount of time before that structure really starts to disappear. So it actually lasts for a few tens of millions of years, maybe even up to a hundred million years uh, after the quasar switches on and ionizes that gas. And so we can in principle then study the pre-reionization IgM by looking at reionization epoch quasars. Um, and, and in fact, the proximity, the structure we see in the proximity zone is quite sensitive to this. So here I'm showing, there's now a higher resolution simulation that I'll describe on the next slide, where uh, I'm, I'm showing here a no reionization model versus a uh, reionization happening very early model. So these are both at redshift seven and a half, but here reionization occurred very early. And so the gas has expanded and, and blown up. If we look at, if we now take skewers many, many skewers through these simulations, stack them together or stitch them together and then run radiative transfer simulations. Uh, what we get is something like this. So, so because these boxes have the same initial conditions, we can compare them uh, directly. And you can see here that the, the sort of hot versus cold models look quite a bit different. Uh, that the cold models have, have sharper, uh, more opaque features in them. Uh, so this might be something that, for example, Huan Ching's uh, uh, density uh, reconstruction might, might even be sensitive to, which would be really exciting. But I'm not going to talk about that because I didn't know about that until 10 minutes ago. Um, so uh, we can see here that there does seem to be a difference, that the, that the proximity zones are sensitive to this, to this very small scale structure, despite the fact that they've been thermally broadened by much larger than these very small scales. Uh, and I can answer questions about that later if people are curious. So uh, there what we, what we study in this work are, are two primary ways that you could suppress the small scale structure that might be in proximity zones. So one, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, is, is X-ray heating. So if we have X-rays that heat the gas and slightly pressure smooth it prior to the quasar turning on, that could give rise to, to suppression of, of structure. And also warm dark matter. So if, if the dark matter is, is something, is some sort of model that suppresses small scale structure, uh, can also be, it can also then be imprinted in the proximity zone. Uh, we run these simulations uh, quite carefully. So it turns out when you're modeling scales like this at early times, you have to take into account uh, the, the drift velocity of baryons versus dark matter, um, uh, both by inputting a velocity and also uh, by changing the initial matter power spectrum. It's, it's kind of a mess. Uh, but fortunately there was a code available that let us do that easily. Um, now, uh, what we get, so we run uh, a few boxes exploring these different uh, scenarios, so warm dark matter and x-ray heating. Uh, the warm dark, um, here I'm just showing, you know, one, one skewer through uh, all these simulations. You can see that there are variations between the black cold dark matter case and sort of these different warm dark matter and x-ray heated models. 
uh, and moving on because I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, the, the question then, now that we've established that we can get these differences in the spectra from the small scale structure, can we actually detect this observationally? And so with this sort of observational setup, maybe like an XQR2 or XQR10 or something in the, in the distant future, near distant future, um, uh, we, can, we can compress those proximity zone spectra into some of people's favorite statistics. For example, the power spectrum, uh, looking at the strength of fluctuations and just the, the PDF of the flux in pixels inside the proximity zone. And we see that, that in, indeed the, the cold dark matter, the cold cold dark matter case uh, seems to be distinguishable from these sort of more extreme cases. This is sort of 2000 Kelvin X-ray heating and 5 keV warm dark matter in the yellow and blue respectively. Uh, and on this plot, the, the blue and yellow are overlapping pretty severely, but they're both there, I assure you. Uh, if we now uh, perform inference from these spectra, this is now a reasonably challenging uh, procedure to do because uh, we know that the likelihoods are not per particularly multivariate Gaussian, so we have to do a little bit of trickery in order to, to uh, get rid of that. Uh, but we find that, that in principle, with a sample of 10 redshift 7.5 quasars with uh, moderate resolution and reasonably high signal to noise, we should be able to constrain warm dark matter models up to about 10 keV. And actually, perhaps more interestingly to people who don't believe in warm dark matter, uh, we'd be sensitive to, to say 1000 Kelvin of X-ray preheating. This is something that, that uh, 21 centimeter uh, observations are very interested in. Um, and so we think we could actually constrain this using these Heisen proximity zones. And I'll just end here uh, showing off uh, the summary slide and I'll, I'll take questions, thanks. Thank you very much. You can all. Okay, um, questions. So we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, first question If quasars form in the highest mass halos, ionization in the region around the quasar may have started much earlier. Should that be a caveat for your conclusion? Uh, sorry, I was reading another message that apparently people could see this some, some build thing on the side. Uh, right. Uh, Will, will the quasars in high density peaks, so randomization may happen earlier? Would that be an issue for you? Yes, so this, this is definitely an issue. Um, so this is something that, that, of course, is very difficult to simulate with only a one megaparsec box. Uh, this is something we plan to explore first by just expanding the boxes to be bigger, and then later um, looking into potentially doing some kind of a zoom simulation. The, the problem here is that to really explore the whole proximity zone, you need to get to scales of say a couple of tens of co-moving megaparsecs. So your, your high resolution part of your simulation needs to be 10 or 20 megaparsecs. And you need to resolve down to sort of one kiloparsec scales at the mean density. So I don't mean like with lots of refinement, I mean, I mean at kind of your base grid needs to resolve uh, one kiloparsec. And so this is currently outside of kind of our current uh, capabilities with, with big supercomputers. Uh, I think it'll become more possible in sort of five to 10 years. Uh, there are new exascale machines coming online uh, in the US that may make this possible. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, it, it should make a difference. Thank you. We can do one more question. Uh, can you resolve the degeneracy between the fact of a form dark matter and X-ray heating? So currently we think we can't. Uh, and so I think we would, be, we would be more comfortable with saying, you know, giving a constraint on one versus the other or one at fixed value of the other. Um, currently, like just with the statistics that we've looked at so far, so just the, the flux PDF and the power spectrum, they seem to be pretty degenerate. Uh, not exactly degenerate, so some kind of joint constraint may be possible, um, but that degeneracy is probably the biggest weakness of this. Although a detection of either is still is still interesting, and so then it just becomes a matter of interpretation of which you know which do you prefer that that cold dark matter isn't real, or do you prefer that the universe is X-ray heated? Thank you. Uh, there are more questions in Slack that you can uh, answer later. So let's move on to our last talk, uh, last formal talk to conference, uh, which is by uh, Rikako Ashimoto on um, proximity zone in uh, fainter quasars. Please go ahead. Okay, I will share my screen. Can you see my screen? 
Yep, clip perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I'm Rikako Ishimoto, a master student of the University of Tokyo. First of all, thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity mm -hmm. to present my research. Today, I would like to talk about the proximity zone analysis of inquisitor spectra at let six. The paper about this study has just been accepted, so I would be happy if you check our paper. I think you have already listened about the importance of proximity zone in the talks so far, but let me briefly introduce the observational studies of proximity zone. In earlier studies, it is said that proximity zone evolved with red shoes, like shown in the left figure. Mm -hmm. However, recently, Iris et al. measured the proximity zone sizes of 30 luminous quasars and found a shallow redshift evolution, shown in the right figure. One of the reasons of this disagreement of these studies is that they are based only on luminous quasars. The proximity zone measurements of a wider luminosity range is needed to conclude the trend. So we measure the proximity zone sizes of fainter quasars, which are thought to be more common in the universe. We use quasars which are discovered in Subaru Heise exploration of low luminosity quasar project, Shelux. Shelux project is based on HSC SSP survey. Using the wide field of view of HSC, we have discovered around 19 Heise faint quasars and some follow up observations such as C2 or MG2 are conducted. So our sample for the measurement of proximity zone consists of 11 quasars from Shelx and 26 quasars which are used in Naira set of 2017. Hereafter, I call this 11 Shelx quasars faint sample and the other 26 quasars bright sample. In this figure, I show the distribution of the absolute magnitude and red shift. The orange dots and gray dots represent the faint and the bright sample. As you can see, the absolute magnitude of the faint sample are down to minus 22.83, significantly fainter than those of earlier stages. And in order to measure accurately proximity zone, we limit our sample to the quasars whose redshift measures by MG2 or C2 or CO emission lines. Since Lyman alpha redshift have large uncertainties in estimating intrinsic spectra, so we excluded such object from our sample. Then let me explain the method to measure proximity zone. The intrinsic spectra for cal calculating the transmission are estimated by principal component analysis, PCA. We used the principal components from Suzuki et al. 2005. The example of the spectra are shown in this figure. Also, we used different principal components from those used in Naira et al. But our measurements of the bright sample are in good agreement from those in Naira et al. shown in this figure, except for the some quasars with updated redshift in show, showing the red points. The definition of the proximity zone is the same as used in the previous studies. 
Here, let me explain our results. First, this figure shows the mean stack spectrum of faint and bright sample shown in orange and black line. As you can see in this figure, the, bright, uh, the faint sample shows a narrower lime alpha emission line. And we measure the proximity zone sizes of faint and bright sample. And faint sample have a significantly smaller proximity zone than that of bright sample. And next, we investigated the luminosity dependence of our sample. The red and gray dots indicate the faint and the bright sample, respectively. And the power of it to our sample shows this relation shown in blue line. And this relation is close to the prediction with the ionized IGM shown in green line. So this implies that the surrounding IGM is mostly ionized at the epoch. So in order to examine the redshift evolution after this, we use the best bit, this relation, to correct the proximity zone sizes by luminosity. So hereafter, I show the proximity zone sizes of proximity zone sizes by collected, collected by luminosity. And this figure shows the redshift evolution of our sample. Our a power of it to all, all quasars of our sample shows shown in blue line shows this relation. This is slightly steeper than that of Iris et al, but significantly shallower than that of those of earlier studies. And our faint sample shows no redshift evolution showing this orange line. So we concluded that our measurements shows a mild evolution, suggesting that proximity zone sizes are not sensitive to the neutral fraction of the universe. Interestingly, uh, yeah. then Davis et al. 2018, in the, their simulation demonstrated that young quasars showing this purple line tend to have small proximity zone sizes. And in our normalization, this criteria corresponds to 0 0.9 megaparsec shown in this red region. The two quasars in the faint sample and two in the bright sample meets this criteria. And such small proximity zone suggests the young quasar age, younger than 10 to 4 years, or the existence of the neutral gas island in the lion site. So in order to check the possibility of the young age, we examine the black hole masses and the Dinton ratio of our sample. But there is no clear correlation between them However, some observational results support the possibility of the young age. First, one of the young quasar candidates, this shows significant carbon for blue shift with respect to MJ2 lines, suggesting that strong outflow due to young quasar age. And another young quasar candidate, this were observed to have no lime alpha halo, implying that this do not have enough time to light up surrounding IgM. And interestingly, our faint sample has high fraction of small proximity zone than that of bright sample, but but larger sample is needed for clear conclusion. So in summary, we measured the proximity zone sizes of 11 faint quasars at redshift 6. 
and we expanded the dynamic range of luminosity to the faint end. The obtained luminosity evolution is close to the model with the ionized IGM, suggesting that the surrounding IGM is mostly ionized at the epoch. And the redshift evolution is relatively shallow, implying that the proximity zone sizes is not sensitive to the neutral fraction of the universe. And there are some exceptionally small proximity zone sizes. This implies their quasar young age. However, larger sample and follow up observation are needed for clear conclusion. And that's it for my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for a great talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, let me ask you a quick one. Maybe I just didn't catch it. Um, how how was the redshift determined for these uh, faint quasars? Was it Magnum 2 or ELMA? Uh, I think it was observed by ELMA. OK. By MC2 or C2 emission. Okay, because of course they're they're smaller to serum sizes, so the rest should become more even more important. Um, any other questions? All right, so if people have more questions, please uh, just use Slack and continue discussion. Uh, before I hand it back to uh, Sarah for some uh, concluding remarks, I just want to thank all the speakers, in particular, I want to thank Sarah and uh, the. Uh, the uh, SATHERAC organizers for putting out this uh, really nice conference. So let's just give them a round of applause. All right. All right. Great. All right, Sarah, it's yours. Uh, thank you, Shawi. It was really uh, it was a really nice experience organizing this conference. It feels like no in-person conferences will happen for quite a while again so it's good to meet up at least virtually uh, i've tried to summarize the, the most interesting points at least to me from this conference uh, just really very briefly uh, it's incredible how many quasars that appreciates more than six we have found. We heard from uh, Eduardo uh, about this incredible growth in the number of high Z quasars in the last 10 years. Uh, and it doesn't seem like it's going to stop anytime soon, uh, either from uh, James Webb or surveys uh, that include more, more bands, both broad bands and narrow bands. Uh, this number could explode to the point where we have found all bright quasars up to redshift nine. Uh, in, in, in a decade or so. A, it's a really good time to be working in this area. Uh, the most, uh, I, I think the problem that was brought up the most often at the conference was uh, the, the, the massive supermassive black holes powering those quasars. Uh, how can we grow them uh, and assemble them so fast uh, in the first billion years? Uh, so there seems to be a problem with funneling the gas efficiently into the cores of galaxies. And that, another thing is a nice parallel with what we heard today from proximity zones. It seems like the, the, the accretion phases, or at least the UV bright accretion phases of these high Z quasars are really short and definitely too short to grow the black holes in only the phase we are currently seeing. Uh, so it would be nice if we had a, a way to bypass this by forming seeds, maybe instead of 10 to the three solar masses, just a few orders of magnitude more would ease this problem significantly. Uh, and it's good to see that uh, more physics are being explored that were previously not thought to be relevant. Uh, and I think this issue of uh, funneling the gas into the cores of galaxies at high Z is particularly relevant because we're starting to see those galaxies in action. And, it, and they do seem to be affected by feedback even at these very early times. Uh, so. Uh, both for the dust temperature and for very large scale outflows, as we heard about today. Uh, so, so there is definitely a, a give and take of the quasars at the centers and the host galaxies uh, around them. And this is the, the area which will probably grow the most with James Webb. 
uh, I, both because we open up the infrared and most of the star formation could be obscured and we actually don't know very much about these hosts uh, and because we can detect them directly, hopefully, uh, finally, after many years of trying. Uh, and as Shawi mentioned earlier, it's amazing how many uh, scientific topics can be reached by using early quasars. So there was a huge variety of, uh, of science that, that we heard this quasar being applied to, from uh, uh, increasing the uh, brightness of the first population, free populations, uh, to IgM science, dark matter, IgM heating, and, and uh, cosmic metallicity enrichment. Uh, so it's, a, it's definitely a very good time as we get into quasars. It's, it's very nice to see. Uh, and while I still have all these people here, I, I would like to uh, basically ask you all what you're most excited about. Well, what do you think are the biggest issues uh, in, in growing these quasars at high Z? Uh, and, and, what, and what are the best ways to uh, investigate them? So if I, if I hold you hostage to get your opinions, uh, these are, these are just a range of the things we've heard about uh, in, in those two days, from black hole seeds to accretion rates uh, and the difficulties of funneling the gas uh, into the centers. And some, it's multiple choice. So if you think any of those are poorly understood, uh, feel free to take all of them. Uh, I, I'd, I'd be of the opinion we don't know much about any of these things. Uh, and. And while this finishes, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers again. So uh, especially Steve Feldkulstein and, and Steve Wilkins for starting this Sazerac series. I definitely hope to see you uh, at the next ones in the next coming months. And, and Will Roper uh, for all the online uh, coordination and the YouTube stuff, uh, as well as the staff at MPIA for providing this Zoom room for us to use uh, and all the IT support behind the scenes. Good. So more than more than more than half the people have replied now. So let's see what the results are. So seeding seems to be uh, where people think there is most wiggle room to help this problem, which which is interesting. Uh, it, it's different. It, it's definitely the easiest way uh, to grow these black holes fast if they if they start already quite big. Uh, and there's a lot of hope for James Webb, uh, for, the, for the next generation facilities. Not much hope in current ground-based facilities, uh, which is a bit sad. Uh, and, uh, and people still value just theory and modeling. So there, there might still be uh, significant results to come from better modeling of these effects uh, with upcoming computing facilities. I think this is really interesting. We'll see how this changes uh, after all these facilities are online for a few years. Okay, so I think uh, with this I will leave you all and I hope you have uh, a nice rest uh, and see you all at the next ones. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. This was great. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, very much so. And did you say that talks will be all available uh, online? Uh, yes, they will all be available online. The full stream and each individual talk will be uh, edited. Okay. okay, great. Thank you so much. It was really enjoyable. Thank you. <laughs>